In the summer of 2007, in the heart of a forest in Northern California, hundreds of people were gathered for a yearly art and music festival. It was meant to be a celebration, a weekend filled with creative expression, dancing, and sure, probably some illegal substances. But it was all said to be a mostly wholesome affair, and one that attendees had been looking forward to all year. On the evening of the festival's first night, after a day of painting, performance art, interpretive dance, and folk pop fusion, the organizers put together a massive bonfire. Everyone gathered around, roasting marshmallows and vegan hot dogs, and breaking out their acoustic guitars for a sing-along. It was all going well, and they were heading into the third refrain of Kumbaya, when a group of friends adding logs to the fire noticed something odd. Some of the flames at the edge of the fire pit were moving in a different direction than the rest. While most of the flames flickered upward, some tilting slightly with the direction of the wind, these flames were moving sideways against the wind, stretching themselves out towards the grass. It seemed bizarre, impossible, and they wondered at first if perhaps the brownies they had eaten earlier had more than just chocolate in them. But then, the flames kept moving, taking on a familiar shape. They were dancing orange and yellow flames, there was no doubt about that, but they also seemed almost like fingers. The fingers extended outward, grasping for something. Attached to the fingers was a hand, then an arm. Another hand joined it, twisting into the grass, which dried and crackled at its touch. One of the friends, a young woman named Flower, attempted to alert one of the event staff but they were too busy trying to get their marshmallow to the perfect shade of golden brown. Unable to get any help, she watched helplessly as the fiery hands dragged a head, a torso, and the rest of a humanoid body behind them. It looked like the shape of an ordinary man, with the glaring exception that it was made entirely out of fire. It stepped out of the fire pit and began to take slow, halting strides toward the gathered crowd. Now everyone took notice of what was happening, First, they froze in shock, staring at this being of pure flame, unbearable heat raining off of him as he moved closer and closer. When he reached out a hand toward Flower, and the arm of Flower's dress ignited in flames on contact, the first scream broke through the silence. When they marketed this year's event as Burning Man in the Woods, this was not what they had in mind. But there he was, just the same. A man made of flames tearing through what was meant to be a peaceful and happy event with no dangers beyond exhaustion, dehydration, and maybe a noise complaint or two. Instead, the crowd scattered in every possible direction, running for their lives. It was already too late for poor Flower, who fell to the ground shrieking in agony as the fire engulfed the organic material of her dress and the flaming man pulled her into its deadly arms. Her screams went quiet, drowned out by the crackling roar of the fire as it fed on her flammable body. Once Flower was nothing but a pile of bones and ashes, the entity began to walk slowly, purposefully, through the woods with its arms outstretched. It brushed its fingertips over everything it passed, every tree, every stump, every plant or scrap of fabric torn off of a branch. The fire began to spread like, well, wildfire. By the time the first festival goers made it out of the forest and into the nearby town to get help, dozens of acres of forest were ablaze and over 50 people were dead. The fire department was deployed to the forest, where they were able to contain the blaze after hours of work. Meanwhile, word of the man made a fire that destroyed the art and music festival reached the only people qualified to deal with such a creature, the SCP Foundation. They deployed operatives embedded in the local police force, who joined the fire department under the guise of providing reinforcements. Once the blaze was contained and the area was largely safe to enter, they followed the path of the fire and tracked the being responsible for all of the destruction. They found it, shrunk to the size of a small child, huddled in the fire pit where it all began, as if it was hiding from the fire hoses. Then they apprehended the being, later designated SCP-457. SCP-457 is comprised of unknown materials, though obviously it is made up of something flammable. Whatever it is, it is made up of something invisible and impossible to detect by any known scientific means. The only visible aspect of the entity is the flames it produces, which tend to make up a humanoid shape as long as it has enough fuel to reach that size. 
If it does not have enough fuel, it shrinks in size, becoming as small as the single flame atop a lit match. In its smallest form, it is indistinguishable from any other small flame except for the occasional display of independence, such as jumping to other fires or flammable materials, which it can then use to grow larger. When it is large enough to take on a human form, SCP-457 displays human-like intelligence and is capable of communication through writing, which it does by burning letters into surfaces with its flames, or even through speech. Though it lacks the anatomy to produce a traditional voice, it produces coherent sounds via pressurized, superheated air, as well as the crackle of its flames. If provided with enough fuel to grow beyond humanoid size, the entity can split into two or more beings, depending on how much fuel it is given. However, this split state does not last, as the separate instances of SCP-457 will attempt to attack each other until they are the only one left standing. SCP-457 seems to want nothing more than to consume more and more fuel and spread as far as it can. It has shown a troubling ability to learn and adapt, purposefully breaking and interfering with sprinkler systems in the building and setting up elaborate traps for personnel it does not like. Dr. Smythe, head of the research team assigned to SCP-457, conducted an interview with the subject on a rare day where it was feeling cooperative in order to better assess its psychology and motivations. Dr. Smythe entered SCP-457's containment chamber, carrying a fire extinguisher in case of any hostility on the part of the entity. He stood on the other side of the blast-shielded window for extra protection. It crackled pleasantly in the corner, seeming to welcome him inside. He asked if it was capable of or willing to speak. It answered, yes. He asked how it felt about being confined. It responded plainly, dislike, no fuel, no air. When Dr. Smythe reminded the entity that it had enough air and fuel to survive, it argued that it could not burn and had no fuel. To clarify, Dr. Smythe asked, are you saying that you cannot grow? At this question, SCP-457 moved back and forth through the small section of the room, as if pacing and looking for something. It said, grow, need, must grow, and when asked how it felt, it simply said, hungry. As the questioning continued, the entity approached the window and stretched a hand made of flame toward the glass. For a moment, it stopped responding to Dr. Smythe. In order to get the being's attention back, he casually brought up the subject of water. At the very mention of it, SCP-457 let out a high-pitched scream and pressed itself against the window in a threatening gesture. Dr. Smythe warned it that it must move away from the window or it would be doused in water. It moved back, but screamed and hissed for several more minutes, offended and upset. SCP-457 resumed its pacing at a more aggressive speed and intensity. All the while it repeated, want fuel, want air, want burn, want burn, want to burn, again and again, getting louder and louder as it moved. Dr. Smythe was perplexed by this behavior, noting that there was no way out and wondering what it could be trying to accomplish. At this point, the interview took a turn for the disastrous. Somehow, SCP-457 was able to damage the sprinkler system and a section of the fuel injector that had been providing it with a small stream of fuel. With the nozzle broken open, several gallons of gasoline came flooding out, allowing the entity to grow to an incredible size in a sudden, massive, destructive blast. Exploiting a weakness in the blast shielding, SCP-457 was able to escape its containment for several minutes, burning its way down the hall of the facility until the larger sprinkler system activated, sending it hissing back to its cell. There it was apprehended by a team of guards and herded into a new, higher security cell. It is unknown how exactly the entity became aware of the weaknesses in its containment chamber, but this incident revealed that it is a highly intelligent being capable of problem solving. However, it learned this information and figured out how to exploit it. The Foundation realized that more extensive measures would need to be taken to keep it locked down and keep the general population safe. Due to the dangerous nature of SCP-457's corporeal form, highly specialized containment procedures have been put in place to keep the flame from spreading. The entity is kept in a 5x5-meter chamber with at least 9 inches of fireproofing in place, including asbestos and perlite. 
The observation window is blast-proof and resistant to extremely high temperatures. The room's opening is made up of temperature-controlled and airtight chambers that can be sealed in the event of an escape attempt. The room itself is kept at a high humidity level and a drain has been installed on the floor. With a sprinkler system in the ceiling and emergency hoses that can be operated if additional water is needed. A small portion of the room is free from water, but only enough so that SCP-457 can maintain its shape and protect itself from moisture. Any personnel that enters SCP-457's containment unit must wear Class A temperature-controlled and flame-resistant suits and must enter in groups of three. Two of the three members of each group must be armed with blast shields and fire extinguishers. Personnel are not permitted to enter the containment chamber for any reason other than providing daily fuel or fixing any issues with the room or its sprinkler system. In some ways, its containment procedures are reminiscent of a particularly spicy variant of SCP-173. If the entity attempts to attack any personnel, it can be deterred via the application of fire extinguishers or hoses until it backs down. If it escapes from containment, further sprinkler systems will be activated throughout the facility in order to contain the fire. The highest priority, aside from keeping the entity contained, is keeping it fed. Because it needs constant fuel in order to survive, the Foundation is currently prioritizing finding an infinitely renewable source of fuel. Though many have been proposed, including the use of other SCPs such as SCP-2689 and SCP-124, no source has been officially approved yet. In the meantime, they keep the burning being fed and happy, or as happy as it can be. It will never be truly satisfied until a day arrives where it can be permitted to spread as far and wide as it wishes, to burn and feed and engulf everything in sight. Let's hope that day never comes, but if you start to feel unusually hot, if the walls seem to suddenly blacken around you, and you hear the final crackles before the hissing tongues of flame lick at your bubbling skin, well, by that point, it'll already be too late. Now go check out This SCP Does Not Exist, SCP-3930 The Pattern Screamer, and SCP-173 Origin Story How 173 Got to Site-19 for more strange and unusual SCPs.